it, it's tough to think about what's been in my family for well over 100 years not being here in 20. We have uh, plenty of sunlight. We have plenty of good fertile soils. We even have a multitude of highly intelligent, hardworking people here. But the common denominator for all of that is water. Water is the limiting factor in uh, life in general, but Southwest Kansas specifically. From space, the surface of southwest Kansas looks like an arid checkerboard. Center pivot irrigation spins perfect circles of corn and milo in square mile and quarter mile sections. With the help of NASA's GRACE satellite, a view below the surface is now possible. GRACE's ability to measure small changes in gravitational pull allows it to observe changes in water content from glaciers to groundwater. The GRACE data confirms USGS well data and tells a story of dramatic declines in the High Plains or Ogallala Aquifer. These two satellites are not particularly big. Each one is about the size of a, of a squashed minivan and they follow each other around in an orbit over the pulse and as they encounter places that have more or less water um, on the ground, the satellites either get pulled down a little closer to the ground because of the increased gravitational tug, or they float up a little bit higher in their orbits because of the smaller, the decreasing gravitational tug. So we're able to use the satellites to, to map out the places uh, around the world that are gaining or losing water mass. Well, here in western Kansas, uh, our groundwater is the Ogallala Aquifer, the High Plains Aquifer. The Ogallala Aquifer is really granite wash off the front range of the Rocky Mountains over time that washed over the plains, filled in the low spots. It's a very prolific aquifer, very porous, quite permeable, and contains a lot of water. There is recharge, but it's at a very slow rate, maybe a half of an inch per year. The lifeblood of our land is that Ogallala aquifer below us. That comes from the Ogallala Sioux Indian tribe. It extends from north central Texas up through Nebraska. It's the largest uh, freshwater aquifer in the western hemisphere. Uh, in 56, uh, it appeared if we were going to stay on the farm without more acres, we would need to develop irrigation. 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, irrigation was developed in western Kansas, and that's when the high use of the aquifer began. Most farmers were drilling wells at this time and pumping to irrigate. We've been pumping out of that for livelihoods uh, to sustain ourselves and our livestock. Now with the deep turbine pumps and the pressurized uh, center pivot system, you could irrigate just about anywhere any type of soil, and we did. I would say we don't have an original well functioning anymore. They've all been redrilled. Irrigation is a good thing. Over the last three or four generations, we've just overdone a good thing. As we pump water on our crops for irrigation, uh, we're constantly drawing from that like a straw. So basically the water situation that we're in currently is we've been drawing from this aquifer, the source of water for several decades now and now we're down to the very bottom. We're getting down to the bottom of that huge pool of water that in the 50s and 60s we thought was inexhaustible. And in some locations the groundwater has basically disappeared. If you're looking at your car gas tank and your, your gauge, we're clear down to the E. Uh, when grandpa was drilling wells you find big gravel or rocks like this, uh, you were going to find a really good well and now just, uh... Now, the only 
water it finds is a couple three feet at the very bottom of the well that uh, the pumps can't effectively access anymore. We're in Sublette, Kansas. It's the county seat of Haskell County, Kansas. It's kind of the hub of our farm. It started in 1902. My grandfather's father. My great-grandfather homesteaded on this corner in 1902. My great-great-grandfather, he received some ground from his father as a wedding gift. Sometime in 1928, my great-grandmother ordered the house uh, out of a Gordon Vantine catalog. This is where my grandfather was raised and my dad was raised. We're still farming that ground to this day and we've just been building on top of that. So this particular farmstead has been where the last two generations of our family has started out after college. We lived there probably a year before we had any kids. The irony is the new irrigation well we drilled a couple years ago uh, actually led to the demise of the domestic well. Yeah, that was hard. I just, I was like, can't we just drill that well again? Right now my dad and my grandpa and my uncle Jarvis uh, are currently partners in the farm. Jay does more of the economic side, Jarvis does more of the technology side. It tends to work real well together. We've got dad with the, the senior partner, the experience. My brother is the finance guy. He's He's the mark in charge of marketing and our risk management. I don't care for that, so I'm lucky I get to do what I want to do. I get to be out in the field producing more of the hands-on. My brother and I, you know, we still got another 20 years at this before we can even begin to maybe think about retiring. looking at our boys, the next generation, and we're trying to figure out how do we make this thing last longer, uh, this thing being the aquifer. It, it's tough to think about what's been in my family for well over 100 years not being here in 20. Uh, it may mean that my kids or my nephews don't come back, may not even have a chance if that's their desire. When harvest time comes and I see what's come of the things that I've done, that's whenever it really pays off for me and that's when I get an awesome feeling inside. With the 98% of the population that's not working on farms, they need to understand that um, their food isn't coming from the grocery store shelf. It's ultimately coming from the fields of the heartland of America and that heartland food is fed by the Ogallala Aquifer and the water that we draw from it. I want that opportunity so bad to be able to follow in those steps of my parents, grandparents, and previous generations to see all the hard work that they've put in and with our water situation to see it hit like a brick wall. You know, I would consider coming back, but I'd have to lock in a 40-year investment that um, I, I can't surely make. The corn's 20 kernels around, which is excellent, and it's 45 kernels long, so that's about uh, 900 kernels. And if we multiply that by 30,000 plant population, uh, we divide that by uh, 80,000 kernels per bushel. It tells us that you know this corn would probably yield in the uh, 220 to 240 bushel range, so which be which would be very good. So this is a good crop here, but it only lasts as long as the water's here. And what disturbs me this morning, checking on this irrigation well, is it's showing signs of weakening. When I checked the water there, I found air suspended in the water, and that means that down at the bottom, the pump is starting to gasp air, like when you finish a, a soda with a straw out of a glass. Right at the end, you get that sucking sound. Well, this is the very beginning of that sucking sound. And this will last another five or 10 years, but not even at the production rate that we're at here today. So it's just a question of how much time is left. 
I suppose we should let ourselves enjoy a good crop while it's here, but we can't lose sight of the long term. And that's what I worry about for Jared and Jaden and Jesse and James and Reese and Ryan and Noah. But thinking about Jared and the challenges that that his generation faces, that's what leaves you gasping for air. Kind of leaves you at a loss for what to do next. We'll succeed somewhere. I just. I always thought it would be here. population in southwest Kansas today would be reduced by 90 percent, maybe more, if you removed water from the equation. And that's kind of a microcosm in a way for the whole planet and the way we're looking at uh, the strain, especially on groundwater, fresh groundwater supplies all over the globe. What's happening in the Ogallala is a strong indicator of what, what we can expect. Um, in these other regions of great groundwater depletion. You know, the fact that they're running out of water means that we will no longer be growing food there. This aquifer issue has become kind of the insidious felt but not seen cancer, if you will, that's pitting neighbor against neighbor and communities uh, are tearing themselves apart and that could all change if our state elected officials would step out in the middle of the court and call time out and help us start making some mandatory changes. This is not something that you can solve overnight with just a couple of different policies. And it's not something that if you just enforce a couple of things now, that's going to solve our water problem for the next 50 years. This requires community buy-in for decades. At the rate we're going today, we don't have to 2100 to run out. I think it's closer to 2050 or maybe even less. The good news is all the information we need to take action and buy a longer time horizon is all very clearly here. The only thing missing is the resolve to start by taking the first step. But it has to be a collective effort because an individual is just it just amounts to unilateral economic disarmament if you slow down your pump before your neighbor does.